So a lot of people are going to tell you that keyword research is the first thing you need to do. And I think there's actually a pre-step before keyword research. Okay. Um, if you just dive straight into the keywords, you're going to get bogged down trying to figure out what exactly you should be writing about when really what you need to focus on is finding those proven topics that are going to do well regardless of the keyword that you choose. Welcome to the Magnificent Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top marketing experts in the world and keep you up to date on all the changes and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Bill Widmer, and Bill is an e-commerce content marketing and SEO consultant. He's worked with many well-known brands such as A Better Lemonade Stand, Bold Commerce, and Shopify. One of his favorite things is seeing his content shoot to the top of Google search results. He's also an avid traveler and hopes to spend a full month traveling the U.S. with his girlfriend this year in 2018. And today we are going to be talking about how to create content based on keyword research and get it to rank on Google. Bill, how are you doing today? David, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. Well, let, let's just start off with uh, traveling the U.S. Where, where, where are you uh, wanting to do? I've always kind of wanted to do that as well. I want to go overseas a lot, but uh, here in the U.S., I also want to see everything that we have in our country, too. Do you have any specific plans? Yeah, for sure. There's a lot to see here. Um, I really want to go to Colorado, California, and Oregon are my big three. All but, right. Uh, we're going for pretty much every state, so... Well, very fun. cool. Well, make sure you check out Red Rock Amphitheater in Colorado, right outside of Denver. It's amazing. Absolutely fantastic. All right. Well, let, yeah, uh, for sure. Like, for sure do that. Um, all right. Well, very cool. Let, let's dig in here. Um, just to kind of kick things off, like your thoughts on, on the fusion of content and how it applies to SEO in this day and age. Uh, you know, I know there were various black hat tactics that dominated SEO as recently as five years ago, but I believe things have changed quite a bit. But would love to hear your take on this. Yeah, things have changed a lot in the world of SEO. Um, It's gotten a lot harder in the sense that those black hat tactics, they they do still kind of work if you are sneaky enough about it, but uh, if you get caught, they can really smack you down. Um, As far as the fusion of content and SEO, in my eyes, they're basically one and the same. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nearly impossible these days to rank your website without great content on it. And the reason for that is content is a lot easier to get backlinks to mm-hmm. than, say, a product or category page. And I'm sure we're going to dive into the logistics of that. But, uh, yeah, content and SEO, you just can't have one without the other these days. That's funny. I'm basically saying the same thing. We started offering just SEO services here just because we started to see that, man, content marketing and SEO are basically joined at the hip these days. So if if you're good at content marketing, a few tweaks here and there, you can be good at SEO as well, or at least reap the benefits of, you know, within your own company. And, and, And for the listeners out there, you know, there's a little back and forth recently I I've seen of the importance of SEO and, you know, with, you know, the ads dominating a little bit more, some other stuff here and there. But we'd love for you to kind of clear the air about the importance of SEO as it currently stands today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Organic is still super important. Paid ads are taking up a little bit more real estate these days, and they are dominating a little bit more of the clicks than they used to. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm still seeing an average of 70% of the clicks going to the organic results. Okay. So you're still, if you're going after a keyword that gets 10,000 searches a month, you're still seeing 7,000 of those clicks going to organic. If, if you're of course, it varies. Spots. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, of course, it varies. But as a general sense, organic is still highly dominant. Yeah, and on that note, um, I think you'll agree to this. Um, the best traffic is organic traffic. And when I say that, I mean that you have active, the the challenge that we all have as marketers and business owners and everything is getting the right message to the right person at the right time, right? And socially trying to find out where they are. But if they're if they're searching organically, man, they're further down that buying funnel. And those are the creme de la creme of traffic. Would you Would you agree to that? 
Oh, a hundred percent. If somebody's going to Google and typing in what is the best running shoe, they're like right on the verge of buying. Yeah. Um, people aren't going on Facebook and scrolling down their newsfeed to buy a running shoe. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. yeah. it's just social traffic is, is much more finicky and much more difficult to convert than organic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm right. I'm right there with you. And, and one final question before we get into, you know, all your awesome tips on how, how to rank, can, can you just clarify, you know, kind of set the stage here for what some of the most important current ranking factors are with Google and the other search engines right now? Yeah, 100%. So um, right now, Google has like over 200 different ranking factors, but I'll be honest with you, 95% of them probably don't really make any difference. Um, You can optimize your website to be perfect, lightning fast, look really great, and it still isn't going to rank. Because to be honest with you, there are three ranking factors that are really, really important in this day and age that just completely are head and shoulders above all the others. The first one being backlinks. Um, You need to get backlinks to your website, and not just to your website, but specifically to the page that you're trying to get to rank. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, if anybody isn't sure, a backlink meaning a link from another website pointing to that page on your website. Okay. So that's the number one thing. And then the the number two thing is going to be content performance, which basically uh, this is where we get and talk about LSI keywords which is, it stands for latent semantic indexing, and it's a lot more complicated um, complicated sounding than it really is. Mm-hmm. It's it just, really is. Yeah. It, it's really easy really, to understand. It's just one of those words. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just similar or related keywords. That's really all it comes down to. So if you're selling running shoes, an LSI keyword might be jogging shoes. You know what I mean? Something really, really similar like that. Yeah. And, we'll, and I do want to circle back to that because that's actually been a point of focus. And actually just, I believe yesterday I was with my team and I was like, hey, our new focus needs to not be on the specific keywords. And again, we'll get into this, but it's on topical relevance, you know, and then everything drives that. And But anyways, go ahead. You said number yeah. two, content performance, number three. Yeah, so number two is content performance and making sure you're covering all of the subtopics within your main topic. And again, we'll get into more detail in that in a minute. But number three is going to be user engagement, and that's becoming more and more important, especially in 2018. Uh, Google actually looks at things like dwell time, how long someone stayed on your page, bounce rate, whether or not they visited another page on your website before hitting that back button, and uh, engagement. So like comments, video clicks, um, Mm -hmm. internal link clicks, that kind of stuff. So that's okay. going to be the third most important is that people are actually staying on your page and engaging with that content. Now, how is that different than like content performance? What do you mean by that? So content performance is just making sure that your post or your guide or whatever that is answers all of the questions within that guide. So if you're writing a guide on how to buy running shoes, you're going to want to cover, uh, you know, the different kinds of feet. I, I don't know. I don't know. don't know a lot about running shoes, but uh, <laughs> Like the different kinds of feet, like foot arches and uh, why you might want to pick this material over that material and whether or not the shoe is really as important, maybe the sock is really important too. So it's just basically if someone's coming to you for the best running shoes and trying to do research on that, you're answering all of the other questions that pop up in that research. Does that make sense? Yeah, basically make sure, you know, specifically whatever's, title or whatever you're driving to that it's applicable and it matches up and you're you are actually delivering on whatever title or whatever you did that drove people to read that am i hearing that yeah absolutely and a little practical tip here if you go to a website it's called answer the public oh, yeah. love it and you type in yeah you type in your main keyword it'll give you all of the questions people ask around that main keyword so essentially just make sure that you're answering all of those questions yeah, and I want to kind of put an extra emphasis on that. Everybody pay attention to what he just said. That is absolutely, for a content manager, one of the places they go to every time. It is it is uh, an absolute amazing place to get further content ideas that are very similarly related, but they will give you just different little tributaries, I guess, of different things to write about that are each going to be valuable and they tie around again this whole topical relevance deal so um love it thanks so much all right so let's kind of get into some of the good stuff and and run down your uh, strategy and how to create content 
that gets ranked, you know, starting at the top here, what is the, what's the very first thing a company or a marketer or a person needs to do? Absolutely. So a lot of people are going to tell you that keyword research is the first thing you need to do. And I think there's actually a pre-step before keyword research. Okay. Um, if you just dive straight into the keywords, you're going to get bogged down trying to figure out what exactly you should be writing about when really what you need to focus on is finding those proven topics that are going to do well regardless of the keyword that you choose. And the way that I find proven topics mm -hmm. is you start with the experts and the influencers within your niche. So sticking with our running shoes example, you want to go and look at all of the different fitness blogs, the different running blogs, um, the different shoe blogs, you know, anything that is going to have an audience, people reading their content, and that they become an authority on the subject. And then look at their website. You can use a tool like BuzzSumo, that's B-U-Z-Z. S-U-M-O dot com to see which of their pieces of content have gotten the most shares and backlinks. And then look for the common underlying theme. So if you notice that all of these different shoe bloggers are uh, blogging right now about this brand new shoe that just came out or something, and um, they all have a similar topic and it's all doing really, really well, you know that that topic right now, it's proven, it's really hot, and it's something that you should be talking about as well. Okay. So awesome. Now I got I got to follow up with that, on that. Sure. And, and I and this came from again the I think the conversation we we're having yesterday. I, we we use we use Busuma, but we also you know have a higher level tool called Ahrefs A H R E F S mm -hmm. that we love. And within that does the same thing. You know you you find which ones are hot and uh, that just is logical meaning. All right, well, they've already kind of laid the groundwork to, sh to show us something that's great. Now, with that, though, the ones that have the highest shares and everything are normally the ones that are already getting tons of traffic, you know, the New York Times of the world. So what I, what I had our team and what I'm having them experiment with is flip that uh, where they uh, sort everything by low domain authority, you know, sites that uh, aren't out there a ton in or you know if you if you're getting a, a crap a, a shit ton of ta uh, traffic and everything you're most likely a pretty decent site right so you can have high domain authority so that might lead the shares but i was telling him to flip it and see which ones actually have pretty good shares but a low domain authority meaning maybe this topic is even better if this lower level site is actually getting all these shares Do you kind of follow my line of thinking there yeah i love that I mean, yeah yeah i was just curious <laughs> if you ever well, go for it. Yeah, I mean, it was just something that just dawned on me yesterday. I was like, well, yeah, but those just might get automatic shares. You know, BuzzFeed put something out. It's going to get a ton of shares just because they're BuzzFeed, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that's like super of interest. I'm not saying not to do it that way. I'm just saying another way of thinking about it. Let's go to the other way and see, you know, what are the lower guys? Because they're just as creative. They're just not working with a big platform, you know? All right. Anyways, go on. So you said yeah. – uh, before the keyword research, you're looking for um, information on, you know, topics and stuff that are obviously interesting, interesting to the public in your niche. Okay, go on. Yes, so you look for the fascinating topics first. You look for what's already working first. And uh, I also use Ahrefs. I just mentioned BuzzSumo because they have like a free, free yeah. searches that you can use, so anybody could use it. Um, but once you find those proven hot topics – that's when you dive into the keyword research. So if you find out about this new running shoe, then you start researching, okay, what are the keywords related to that topic? So now you've got the proven topic and you use Ahrefs or Google Keyword Planner or something like that to find a main keyword to go after. And you should always pick one keyword for each page. That's not to say you're only gonna rank for one keyword, but one main keyword. And then we'll get into those LSI keywords again that I mentioned before. But um, that's when you actually dive into the keyword research and try and find the perfect keyword for that page. Okay. All right. And, and that, the, that's the main starting point, or do you have some other tips, that, you know, as, as we, you know, start digging into some specifics here? I would say that's the main starting point. I would keep, rather than just doing one, finding one proven topic, um, write down all of them. Anything that gets a lot of shares, a lot of backlinks that people are really talking a lot about, Write them all down in a spreadsheet and then do research for each one. So that way you have a list of topics you can choose from. Okay. And then I would use that. And I know we're going to talk about um, topical relevance in this cluster model. 
but basically use that to plan your content strategy for the next six to 12 months. Gotcha. And if you do have some higher level tools or you're working with a firm, they most likely, if they aren't using the higher level tools, they better be. But, you know, you can put your website, get your competing websites, you know, the top three or four competing websites. And this is where you run like a, a full keyword analysis. Is that how you go about it as well? Oh, yeah, that's definitely part of it. Okay. So, again, look for topical, I mean, look for topics that are hot. Run your keyword report. And, again, if you really don't know how to do that at all, you probably need to get some assistance there. It's going to be hard for you to, you know, run something without some higher level tools, unless, Bill, you want to speak to that. But you're, you know, to really get a full, you know, scope of, you know, the landscape of your world there as it relates. Correct me if I'm wrong, you really probably need to go through one of these higher level tools. At least we we never knew how until, you know, we got into them. Is that correct? Or is there another way? Yeah, I'll put it this way. Um, I use Ahrefs for everything. It's mm -hmm. absolutely a diehard fan. I love them. Yep. You can use Google Keyword Planner for free. It's going to take you a lot more time. It's not going to be as accurate, and it's not going to have as good of results, but you can still do it if you're just getting started and you don't have any capital to invest in one of these. Okay. Tools. All right, thanks. So. Just for the listeners, we're not going to get into the step-by-step -step for the keyword keyword planner, but I assume you could just Google <laughs> Google keyword planner keyword research, and they'll walk you through it. So that that's the free one, but it, as Bill stated, and we experienced the same thing at the beginning, it's uh, very cumbersome. It's not as accurate, um, but it is a starting point if you have absolutely no budget. All right, so you're going to get these keyword reports, right? And then you're looking at uh, there's different things that tell you you can go as in depth to see where your kind your site currently ranks, but the main uh, some of the other main things that you're looking at are the competition level, and then you're looking at the volume of these words. So I realize some decisions need to be made at this point when deciding on what to go after once you've completed this initial analysis. You know, you can't just do everything. So I would like to hear your take on how you make decisions when evaluating the volume of searches for particular keywords and the keyword phrases combined with how competitive those keywords are. In other words, do you completely stay away from competition levels that are above 50 or 75 or something like that? Or do you still go after those if the volume is high enough? I know that's a specific question, but I want to get in your brain just in general when you're looking at these, what's your, what are you deciphering there? Do you kind of understand my question here? Yeah, I do. Okay. So that's going to depend on a couple different factors. The first one being how high is your domain authority and how much um, how many rankings do you currently have already? Because the more links that you have to other pieces of content already, the easier it's going to be to rank for those super difficult keywords because you can do internal linking and you already have an audience to share with. That being said, I do like to avoid anything over like a 50 keyword difficulty, according to Ahrefs. Again, that's another reason to get that over Google Keyword Planner. But... Um, that's just because anything over a 50, it's going to take you probably close to a year to rank for that unless you're, you have a crazy high domain authority already. Okay. And then as for the search volume, um, I don't Wait, 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 wait. Let, 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 let's define that. You know, when okay. we use the words like high and low, right, what does that mean? So um, let's just say – and, again, if you can do the next step of seeing where you're currently ranked, that might help you if you're, like, on the third page. Well, you might have a chance. If you're ranking over 100 for 50, it's, it's going to take the time that Bill mentioned. So when you say let's just let's – just, and domain authority goes from 1 to 99 or 100, actually. I, I didn't even know that existed until I saw that New York Times at 100. So, like, 1 to 100 uh, – so if it's 50, it's right in the middle. So what sort of domain authority for like a 50 do you say, okay, you know what, it's worth it. We have a chance. Um, well, 50 is in the middle, but it's not really in the middle because it gets exponentially harder as you go up. Mm -hmm. um, so like the difference between 10 and 20 is a huge difference as opposed to 50 and 60. Gotcha. But for uh, a 50 difficult keyword, um, I would say at least a 50 domain authority, according okay. to Moz and Ahrefs, um, but preferably even higher than that. 
Okay, and that's really high for the listeners out there. If that somebody high, has like yeah. a 70 domain authority, they're one of the sites that you absolutely know about, you know, for the, if you're in your, you know, in your niche, you know. So yeah. like 50 is pretty darn good. Even like 30, it's a site that's pretty decent, right? So, all right. So just to kind of put it in context. Okay. So again, the circle. Say, and j just, to, just to clarify on that, even if you're only in like the 30 to 40 some domain authority, going after a 50 keyword difficulty might be worth it um, mm -hmm. if the volume's there and if you're willing to put in the effort. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, th I think we're very aligned on that. That's kind of how we look at it as well. Okay. But let, let's get down to examining this report. Where do you make your decisions on volume, difficulty, all that stuff when you're starting to put your order priority? Sure. So uh, I like to go after the low-hanging fruit first just because it's always nice to see some quick wins. Um, so I'm going to prioritize anything that's lower than, say, a 20 keyword difficulty even if it gets a little bit less search volume, just to get that initial win. And then once you get that, it kind of gets the snowball rolling. Gotcha. Um, in terms of search volume, that is going to vary massively based mm -hmm. on your industry. Um, some industries, 200 searches a month is insane. It's a lot. Some industries, 200 searches a month is like, you would never even want to attempt to rank for that because it wouldn't even be worth your time. Mm -hmm. So, um, in general, I like to see at least 200 searches a month if I'm going to put in this amount of effort in order to rank for something. Hopefully, if it's less than that, it's also a lower keyword difficulty, so it's easier to rank for. You don't have to spend as much time on it. So, so your, your main takeaway here is let things bubble up from the inside out kind of thing and go after the lowest hanging fruit, which would be the lowest – Right, you know, the lowest competition ones. And from there you build like brick by brick on top of that because I, you know, circling back to what we mentioned on some of your key things is user engagement content performance. So if you're starting to rank for these, uh, you know, lower search volume, but you're ranking for them now, you're going to be getting those clicks. And then that starts the snowball effect of starting to allow you to rank because you're getting these good signals because you know, assuming that the content matches what people are looking for, you're getting that, and then that applies to your other efforts as well for some of the harder ones. Is is that your line of thinking? Yeah, David, absolutely. And the other thing that I would think about when I'm trying to choose which keywords and topics to go after, um, again, we're going to talk, talk about this, I think, when we talk about topical relevance, but I would focus most of my efforts around one piece of pillar content. So, You've got this um, running shoes as like your main page that you really want to rank. And then you create like these little clusters around that. So like how to choose running shoes, um, how to take care of your running shoes, how to, you know, relace your running shoes, just whatever that might be. But they're all related to that main piece. Mm -hmm. No, I got gotcha. you. And I think that leads us directly into the topical relevance. And I'm, very, very intrigued to talk to you about this. So, uh, you know, the old saying, the rising tide raise, rises all the ships in the harbor. You know, I believe it directly applies to SEO rankings and that you can rank for a slew of topically relevant keywords or mainly keyword phrases, like what you're saying, how to lace up your running shoes, how to choose the best running shoes, the best running shoes for women, the best running shoes for men, stuff like that. You know, again, Running shoes, I think, is identified as the core keyword, but there's going to be a crap ton of other searches that you might not even be identified in the keyword reports. You know, they might have five, two, eight, 12, 20 searches, but there might be like 200 of those. So can you speak on this for us and let us know your strategy as it pertains to trying to rank this way as far as getting your pillars and, and, and you know you're saying just running shoes but some people have two three four five services that they you know would want to build around but again it's for the purposes of this we'll just act like it's one but if you have multiple it'll apply it down the road so i've been hearing this more and more in the industry over the last couple of years is topical relevance and that definitely you know will circle back to the lsi the latent semantic indexing so Tell me your thoughts on this. What are you hearing? What are you experiencing in regards to this strategy? Absolutely. So one of the best ways I can think of to explain this 
um, HubSpot came up with what they call the pillar cluster model. And it speaks directly to how you're saying if you have different services. So say um, you have your running shoes and then you have all of those articles around running shoes and that's over here in this section of your website. And then say you might also sell, I don't know, yoga pants or something. Then you would talk about yoga pants and all of those different articles around yoga and yoga pants in this section. So then you're creating these, these different clusters and the more that you rank for related keywords, the easier it's gonna be for you to rank for those other related keywords. So if you're ranking for how to clean running shoes, it's gonna be easier for you to rank for how to lace your running shoes because Google sees that there's that topical relevance there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, I guess you kind of mentioned earlier, you get your pillar and then you go to ask the public and you go to all these things and you see all these other things that are in and around that. But you're not going to make a pillar like a top navigation on your home page be about lacing your running shoes. That's going to be a back-end blog that you will then link to, that interlink to that main page, correct? Yeah, so that main pillar page might be like everything you ever needed to know about running shoes, the ultimate guide. And then it would link off to all of your little cluster pages and they would all link back to that filler page. So they all be, it's like this web of content that's all interrelated. Okay, awesome. Now, I, I want to dig in a little bit more about what you just were mentioning about, you know, you might sell yoga pants as well. So, you know, it, it's, you know, in around this topical relevance deal, but how, how do you make decisions on content production when you rank, when you want to rank for various key, keywords that are similar to your business objectives, but not quite the same? You know, like you mentioned yoga pants and everything. But, for example, say, say you have courses on meditation. But then you also mm -hmm. sell products in and around this world, like crystals, yoga mats, stuff like that. What sort of content strategy do you assemble here? Is it the same of what we mentioned, or is, it, is there any variation on that if it's not going to be like the same word, for instance, or it's not going to be within it? Yeah, um, it's going to be similar. Basically, so... What you're asking is you have multiple different services that are kind of related but not directly related. But again, like say say you're you're about you know you have like this spirituality you know in your personal development right, but then you also have e-commerce tied to it in the sense that you sell all these products you know like something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the way that I would prioritize that is figure out which of my products makes me the most money and or gets the most searches per month on Google, and then prioritize my content based around that. Okay, so, so you would basically create a, another content plan for the crystals, the yoga mats, and stuff like that. You, you wouldn't necessarily tie it into the meditation. You would just, you would, you would think of meditation or your personal development as one content track, and then you would just know that you have this other one. So it's similar, but it, it's really almost starting from the beginning uh, in the sense that you're trying to rank for personal development and meditation or whatnot, but then you're also trying to rank for this other stuff. Is that, is that not correct? Not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. Uh, so even though it's similar but not directly related, because you because there's still some relation, you can still add internal links from the mm -hmm. content that you create for yoga to the content that you create for, you know, your meditation class. Mm -hmm. So that link authority is still going to be transferred between those pages. Even though it's not direct topical relevance, it is still related enough and it does still pass that authority through that internal link. So if you're ranking for all this stuff around yoga mats and yoga pants and whatever, um, and then you interlink to your meditation stuff, your meditation stuff is still going to rank higher, even though it's not directly related. Gotcha. Now, now, what, what's the uh, what, what, what's your thought on you know you have those core pages, and I know, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it's good practice to link out and to link. You know, obviously interlinking is great, and I need to get some clarity on on this. But I know when you add or outer link, um, you're giving away a little bit of your link authority. You know, if, if you like outlink, if you have a page that outlinks like two, three hundred pages out, that's going to hurt you, correct? If you, uh, do too much, if you overdo the out outbound link, you give away a little bit, but it's good practice because you got to have the user experience, and you, it's basically like, you know, it's 
there, there's a certain threshold that if you cross, that, that you have too many things going out. I think Google identifies that as some weird practice. It, it, am, am I wrong on that? I'm not sure if Google actually identifies that as a weird practice, but I'll say this. Link out generously, but not to the point where you're just stuffing links into an article. So basically, if you're writing an article and um, you link out to an authority piece on why meditation is good for your mind, body, and soul, or whatever that might be, and it's like some kind of scientific article or um, this really great blog post someone wrote, a, you're showing Google that you're related to those high authority sites. Mm -hmm. And B, now that you're linking to them, you can then reach out to them after you finish that piece of content and say, hey, I linked to your article because it was really awesome. Uh, maybe you want to check out mine. And they might end up sharing to it or linking to it themselves. Gotcha. Now, rule of thumb, like approximately one outlink for every like 100 words. Is that a, is that a good benchmark or is that... Yeah, I would say that's a pretty good benchmark. Um, it's that's something that's so it's it's kind of nebulous. It's hard to give a real accurate rule of thumb on that, but uh, just, just whatever just feels right, I guess. Gotcha. Now, now on that note, though, so we we have these pages. We have our pillar pages. Do you want to interlink to like the 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 yoga mats and the crystals from? the pillar page or do you just want your all your interlinks pointing to that page like do you want it also linking to your crystals and stuff like that i would link them all back and forth to each back other as forth. long as it makes sense no as, as long as it makes sense, sense but yeah. it's good to back back and forth okay like awesome. don't stuff internal links at all that's not going to help you at all but if it's like you have more resources on a certain topic that you're writing about definitely mm -hmm. link to that understood gotcha all right let's get into um Frequency of content, you know, in your experience, is there a sweet spot for the amount of content you need to produce per week or per month needed to rank? And I know this is an impossible question to answer in the sense that there's so many variables when you're talking about, you know, opportunity, meaning how big, how, mo how much of a search volume there is, you know, and the, the difficulty and all of that. But do you have any guidance for people out there? In regards to that? Sure. In terms of ranking on Google, um, Google doesn't care about like freshness or how often you update your website anymore. Uh, going back to those three top ranking factors that we talked about, freshness isn't one of them. Um, as long as your content is good and you know you update it like maybe once a year or something, then that's what Google cares about. So as for a sweet spot, it's more for how much effort you actually have to put into it. If you have enough on your team to produce a piece of content every week and also promote it and build links to it heavily, because that's going to be at least 50 to 75% of your content marketing is going to be promotion and link building, then yeah, every week is good. Personally, I like to do every one to two months, I promote, I publish one piece of content. You push, push a big piece of content though. Yes. So, I mean, you're not just producing a content. I mean, you're one of those that puts out, you know, a fully encompassing thing. So I just want to make sure we clear, we clarify that. You're yeah, not just these producing are, a 500 word blog, you're producing step by step, all that. I've seen your stuff. So yeah, I mean, if you're going to produce a super crazy bang up piece, then, then yeah. So just wanted to clarify because you're selling yourself short when you say, when you say it that way, I mean, you're producing some super high quality stuff. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, for real. Yeah, I mean it. But it's different than just producing a 500-word blog post once every month. You know, it's just that's kind of not that in-depth. You know, that, that might not move the needle as much for you. Yeah. Honestly, a lot of the times these 500 to 1,000-word blog posts that are just like these little things people throw out, um, they're just adding to the noise, and they're not actually going to end up ranking. Mm -hmm. So unless you have an audience that you can promote that to and you know that it performs well, it's probably not going to do you any good. You may as well not even do it at all or slow down and wait to produce the bigger pieces yes exactly gotcha now um since we're talking about content here l let's talk a little bit about this lsi the latent semantic indexing M more commonly you just hear hear semantic search semantic indexing talk about how that relates to your content yeah so essentially anytime i create a new piece of content i always start with an outline 
And in that outline, I'll include the title, some alternative title suggestions, like you know, five to ten alt topic titles that uh, might get clicks. And then I talk about the main keyword, so whatever that main keyword is I want to rank for. And then I add all of the LSI keywords. So I get those by taking that main keyword and I plug it into a tool called lsigraphs.com. You can also get it from uh, Google search suggestions, uh, their autofill suggestions. Um, it's basically highly related keywords and topics that people are also searching for when they search that main keyword. So once I have all of those keywords down in my outline, then I actually go into and create the headers and subheaders within the content. And I try to include as many, uh, I, I include my primary keyword at least once in one of the headers, and then I also try to include as many of those LSI keywords as I can. So uh, Naturally, right? Yes, naturally. Yes, I'm not stuffing anything in. I'm making it so that way I can pull them into it and make it, flow really, really well. And, and basically, you could write it this way or you could write it that way. Write it that way is basically if you can do it, you know, by taking into the semantic, the semantic opportunities, correct? I mean, that's basically your line. If you can do that. If you can't do that, well, then don't do it, right, if it just isn't natural. But you might as well do it the right way, I guess, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, so to give you an example, sticking with the running shoes again, if you're writing this guide on everything you need to know about running shoes, one of your headers might be the different types of running shoes, and types of running shoes might be an LSI keyword. And then you might write um, how to try on running different, shoes. Or different types, right? Yeah, yeah, different types. And then another section might be how to try on running shoes to make sure they're a good fit. Another section might be um, how to tell if a running shoe is breathable enough for you. Um, you know, I, I'm just making this up the top sure. of my head. but. Uh, that's how you include it in those sections and still make it flow really, really well so that it makes sense in the overall primary topic. Yeah, and what the what, and you mentioned L, lsigraphs.com, is that right? Yes. So what that's going to tell you is, hey, you're, you're, th this is exactly what people are actually searching for with these words. And then if you include them, then Google is going to identify that that's, you're writing about that. People are searching about that, and and if you're off by a little bit, you know, I mean, are people using the word tennis shoes a lot still? And if they are, well, then take advantage of knowing that and utilizing that. And if they're not, you know, then then don't, you know, type of thing. But I, I you know, I'm not familiar with that LSI graph. Thanks for that tip. We're going to steal that one from you. Absolutely. <laughs> All right back now. And forth. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's why I love these, doing these podcasts, not just for our own marketing efforts and, and you know our kind of give back to the marketing world, but I learn a lot. Uh, I want to start my own podcast someday. <laughs> yeah. Well, you man, I'll tell you right now, it's one of my one of my main sources of education because the people that we have on here are always so educated that I always pick up tips. Yeah, All you right. guys have some great guests. Go ahead. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. We got another one today. All right, so we mentioned the word backlinks a ton today. Okay, and we're saying get backlinks, get backlinks, get backlinks. Okay, got it. Uh, now, Bill, help us how to get to teach us how to get these backlinks. Yeah, so backlinks, you can have the most amazing piece of content ever. Um, you could have put all this work into it, done all your LSI keywords, have it optimized perfectly, and it's still not going to rank without backlinks. Um, Basically, links from other websites pointing to the page that you want to rank are like votes to Google saying, hey, I vote for this page to rank. The way to get these backlinks, and I'm going to really emphasize here that they need to be white hat backlinks, not black hat stuff like we talked about before. So you're not buying PBN links, that's public blog network. You're not doing link spam and comments or any of that crap. Real high quality backlinks are editorial backlinks from within a piece of content. My favorite ways to get those backlinks, number one, first and foremost, is through relationship building. This is the most genuine, easiest way to get links that I have found, and I've tried almost everything. It's just going out into the world of your niche, figuring out who those influences are, influencers are, and then just striking up a conversation with them, sharing their content, Engaging on their blog, commenting there, um, 
sending them an email, looking at their website, seeing if there's anything you can fix about their website or any tips you can give them, sending them those tips, just opening up a dialogue, a back and forth. And then once you establish that trust and that genuine connection, then it's really easy for you to say, hey, by the way, I wrote this really awesome article today. Um, I think your readers might really get a kick out of it. And then chances are they're going to share it and link to it. It's awesome. really as simple as that, yeah. And, and finding those people? Uh, Google. I mean, if you started off the way that I was telling you with finding the influencers in your niche, you should have a list of these people already. Um, and then just go back to that list and look through it. I would just type in things like um, best blogs about running or best fitness blogs or uh, fitness influencers, stuff like that, and see who comes up. Okay. A any advice on how you initially approach them? Because they're – we're not the only ones doing this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, approach them exactly how you would want to be approached. So you love it when someone shares your content or links to it or uh, comments on your blog. So do the same thing for them. You know, um, just share some of their stuff on Facebook or Twitter, tag them in. Tag, and tag them, right? Yeah. Make yeah, sure they know you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and then maybe send them a friendly email and be like, hey, I noticed this link on your website's broken. You might want to check that out. You know, people appreciate that kind of stuff, especially when you don't make an ask right away. So don't say, hey, here's a broken link. By the way, I want you to link to this. Cause no, no, but what about that, though? Because I have been on the recipient end of that. Someone says, hey, I noticed, because, you know, we have an old blog, you know, that, we, that uh, somebody on the other end of it shut down their site or whatever. For mm -hmm. whatever reason, I have had people contact me and says, hey, I noticed that you have this resource and it's not linking correctly, um, but here, here is our resource just in case you want to replace it. That's not a bad strategy, though. No, you're that's a good strategy. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess I gave a bad example there. It, it's a good – broken link building works really, really freaking well, too, and that is just reaching out and saying, hey, you have a broken link. I have a relevant piece of content that you can link to. But um, what I'm saying is don't just reach out to them and, you know, give them a little tip and then say link to this when it has – you don't build that yeah. connection first. Yeah, you 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 got to shake hands before you go on a date and before you get married and so forth. Exactly. Gotcha. <laughs> a a any other tips in here at all? Yeah. Uh, another one that I found works really, really well is resource page link building. And that's literally um, – you can use the operator on Google. It's – in URL, and then uh, semicolon, and then resources. Say, so, say that again? In URL, semicolon, resources. All one word, no spaces. Okay. And then you put a space, and then a plus sign, and then a space, and then you, whatever keyword it is that you your topic is around. So in URL, semicolon, resources, plus running shoes or plus fitness, or running, or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And that will bring up resource pages around that topic. Okay. And a lot of the time when you go to these resource pages, they'll even have a link that says, have a resource you'd like to see added, let us know. So these people actually want good resources for these pages. So when you reach out to them, they're more open to just adding it without any relationship building whatsoever. Another good tip I'm going to steal from you. <laughs> It's some good stuff. I love these. Don't get me wrong. I, I love the bigger picture podcast as well, you know, but I also really appreciate the take home ones. You know, you're giving some people some actionable items and things they can do. So to recap this part uh, on the back linking, we, you know, obviously it starts with um, making sure you, you know, when you have these relationships that you actually have something to offer them in the form of good content or resource or anything, okay? That's a, that's a table stake. Got to have that. But, okay, now you're looking to get the backlinks and you're going through that. You know, the this is how you can find them, you know, through the various things that we just talked about. And then uh, look to develop a relationship. It's almost like slow down to speed up type of thing. You don't just start pounding everybody uh, with – you know, sending out your content. Instead, it might be better to slow down and get one relationship a month or every other month. You know, at the end of the year, you have six or 12 of them, you know. And, and I will say, and Bill speak to this, especially for some smaller companies that are going after a lower ranking keyword, 
getting five or ten backlinks to you will put you above the competition. Now, five to ten is going to be very small if you're competing with higher stakes and higher stuff, but uh, that alone is a needle mover for certain keywords, certain companies. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, and I think that's what people sometimes don't understand because it seems so daunting because they see people with all these backlinks, all this stuff, say, hey, just so you know, it's it's all relative. You're playing in a lower stakes game. You're not, um, you know, you're not some company that needs to generate millions and millions a year. I mean, uh, of revenue a month. You might want to, you know, you're 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 in a local market, but it's going to be needle moving for you. So you can do this. And and with Bill's advice and strategy here, you you will get results if you just get a few wins here and there. Uh, those few wins will result in massive results potentially, assuming you know the landscape of what you're looking to rank for is obtainable. Okay, awesome. Now tracking, we want to see how we're doing, right? Uh, what do you do uh, in regards to you know looking for your positive progress here? You know, I I, I think we all know that SEO normally is a, a long-term game, and there will be some ebbs and flows in regards to ranking fluctuations. But you do, need, you do need to know if you're heading in the right direction. So please give us your insight on how often you check and track progress and what you mainly are looking at and analyzing. Um, I check it way too often. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, I know that feeling. But what do you want? I'm on what, what you... like every day, like, oh, did I move up the spot? Oh, did yeah, I move right. Up the spot? It's bad. Um, no, I would check it at least weekly, um, if not every other week, at a minimum. Mm-hmm. And essentially what you're looking for is small increases as increases in ranking. So if you go from position 85 to position 75, that's a step in the right direction. That means you're doing something right. Um, you're going to see big increases, most likely, up until like the second or third page, which is when things are going to slow down a little bit and mm -hmm. it's going to become more difficult. Okay. So in order to track this stuff, I actually do use Ahrefs. Uh, it's an amazing tool for that purpose. It'll actually show you all of the keywords that you rank for and whether you're going up or down in them. So you're looking for overall positive trends over time. Mm -hmm. If you don't have Ahrefs, again, you should probably find it, but if you can't get it, uh, I think it's Webris or Web Webris, I'm not sure. They have an SEO dashboard for Google Analytics, webris.org. And that'll actually show you exactly how much organic traffic you're getting and to which pages it's going to. Um, it's not as detailed as Ahrefs, but it does give you a general benchmark as to whether you're going up or down. What about the search visibility? Is that something you uh, keep a keen eye on, just the overall search visibility? Yeah, I do look at it. Um, I tend to look at specific keyword rankings more often than not, unless you're you know, a big site that has like over 200 pages or something like that, then the visibility is, is usually a better, more quick thing to look at. So you can just say, okay, my visibility is going up. That's a good sign, as opposed to looking at 200 different keywords to see where your mm -hmm. rankings are. And you're looking for rankings, not search traffic, organic traffic, because that could vary based on times of the year and stuff. Is that what you're looking at as progress versus overall organic traffic? Yeah, I do look at overall organic traffic, but exactly like you said, uh, it does trend over the year. So some things are steady throughout the whole year. Other things, you know, around the holidays, it might go up or down or something like that. So yeah, um, overall rankings is usually the best thing to look at. Okay, cool. All right, now let's get into setting some expectations. Uh, that's always the magic question that um, it's hard to answer, right? Everyone wants to rank right away, but you know, it's not necessarily how SEO works. So can you give your take on what people can reasonably expect? And on that note, can you speak to this in terms of competition levels, as I believe you can rank much faster for, obviously, a keyword or phrase that has competition of five versus 95, of course. So if you can put it in context, too. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I would say Anything under a 10 keyword difficulty, if you really go hard and you build a lot of links, you could probably rank for that in under three months. Okay. Um, but as you go up, that's going to get progressively harder, and you're looking at you know six to 12 months to really start seeing some significant results. For, for, and that's for 50 or less. 
That's uh, yeah. Eventually. Anything like anything like maybe forty to fifty and up is when you're gonna. It's gonna start getting into the six to twelve month range. Okay, and, and anything yeah. above that, you're looking at much longer potentially. But again, if you're gonna put the effort to rank for something that's really difficult, that most likely it means it has a ton of opportunity, meaning search volume and applicable search volume for your company. So. Uh, it's just like investing in your 401k, I guess, right? So, but it, it's hard to tell further than that because there's so many factors. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, David, I would agree with that. And another thing I want to make really, really clear too is that you can't just publish this thing and say, "Oh, in six months it's going to rank." Now, uh, it doesn't work like that. You have to put in continued effort in order to get that ranking after six months. You have to continue to build the links to keep that content relevant, maybe even run some PPC ads to it or whatever that might look like. It's not like you just produce this and then six to 12 months, you'll magically be ranking for it. Well, yeah, then you mentioned all the other, you know, ask the public, so you write in and around that. So it's consistent effort. Yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. I was just trying to give some people some realistic expectations because everyone wants it right now. And that's just, everyone needs to understand that's just simply not how it works. And, if you want it right now, do paid ads. <laughs> yeah. That's about uh, the only instant thing you can find these days. Well, pay, paid ads for traffic, but you know, yeah. again, it's still not magic formula to, to rank you right away, but it, it is a part of the equation to help you. So um, common mistakes. What, what are one of the top one or two common mistakes that you see people make that you're saying, stop doing that right now? And you might have already mentioned it, but just want to drive it home. Yeah, we did already mention this, but um, just – Publishing and praying, spray and pray method, just uh, throwing articles out and then not doing anything with them. You really, really, really have to focus on promoting that content and building links to it because you can publish consistently week after week after week for years and not get anything from it because you don't have the promotion to drive that effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Now, uh, I want you to pull out your crystal ball. Hey, I want you to look into it and tell me, do you see any changes coming uh, in 20, you know, here in the new year or uh, next year in the next couple of years in regards to SEO and organic rankings and anything that you're seeing out there? All right, David, I got my crystal ball. I'm rubbing it. Looking inside. I see, I see the smoke. <laughs> it's shifting. It's opening up. It's opening up. Oh, I see. I see it. Conversational language. Um, people are going to be, using voice search a lot more this year and mobile. Okay. Uh, Google is moving to the mobile first index possibly this year. So that's going to mean that they're indexing the mobile version of your site first. So if your mobile version of your site sucks, that's going to hurt your rankings. Um, if your content isn't conversational, if, it's, if it sounds robotic or stiff, it's going to have a harder time ranking because people are going to literally be pulling out their phone and saying, um, okay, Google, what's the best running shoe for me to buy today or something okay. like that. And, and it's going to be conversational language as opposed to someone typing something into a keyboard. So mm -hmm. if your content is conversational, actionable, um, you know, relates to the reader, that's going to help your rankings. And as long as it looks good on mobile and I could talk a whole hell of a lot about that too, but uh, we're getting towards the end here. So I'll leave that out for now. Okay. Awesome. And, and but that, you know, relates back to the semantic portion of it, correct? Yes, that is a large part to do with it, for sure. Gotcha, gotcha. So I think today Bill has given you the blueprint for ranking success. Um, also, set it some uh, expectations for us. You know, so it's not uh, going to be instant success, but if you follow these, these you know, follow this methodology and you start correct, you know, you don't just want to start writing, you know, plan it out, get, make sure you're writing stuff that is absolutely pertinent to your target audience and then do the sweat equity required with the relationship building, the backlink building and, and getting this distributed to your, your uh, audience. You know, you will have SEO success. Well, Bill, this has been very fun absolutely educational really appreciate your time how can people continue to learn from you awesome david it has been a great time thank you so much for having me uh if you do want a true blueprint to ranking success i just published a white hat seo case study of how i got a number two ranking and over a thousand daily visitors in less than six months and you can find that on my blog it's billwidmer.com slash white hat seo with all dashes in between every word Gotcha. Um, 
The other thing, if you don't have the time or energy or know-how to invest in this kind of thing, you can definitely hire out someone to help you do it. Uh, specifically for me, I work with B2B businesses around e-commerce and marketing. So if you're in that niche, definitely hit me up. Even if you're not, and if you have any questions on this podcast or any of the content that I have, feel free to shoot me an email. You can send it to bill at billwidmer.com, and I'll be sure to get back to you. Awesome. And for the listeners, uh, Bill's last name is spelled W-I-D-M-E-R. All right, Bill. Appreciate it. And uh, until next time. Yeah, David, definitely. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast. Feel free to go to magnificent.com forward slash blog to see the show notes for this interview, as well as those from many other of the world's top marketing experts. Have a great day.